Welcome to our careers webinar on the interesting and exciting topic, how to establish an international career in law. This webinar will explore the diverse perspectives and experience of our panelists who have lived and worked overseas in countries including the UK, Hong Kong and the US. We will learn about the challenges in navigating the differences in jurisdictions, the cultural and lifestyle nuances, the highlights and learnings along the way. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are sitting at this time and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I am pleased to welcome our first speaker, Ross Dakin. A little bit about Ross. Ross is a qualified lawyer with over 15 years experience as a lawyer and legal recruiter in Brisbane and overseas. Ross holds a Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts from the University of Queensland. He began his career in recruitment in 2004 in the London head office of a global agency and worked in their financial services regulatory and compliance team covering the UK and Europe market before moving into the legal recruitment team. During this time, he placed lawyers in private practice in Magic Circle UK and US firms. Returning to Australia, Ross practised as a solicitor with a respected Queensland law firm before establishing the legal function, recruitment function for a national search and selection company in Brisbane. He then reconnected with his friend and colleague while working at a Brisbane boutique agency before establishing Peppercorn Recruitment. So welcome, Ross. Um, what I thought we could just start off with is perhaps if you can just give us a overview of your career to date, <laughs> including maybe just a couple of the significant highlights. Yeah, um, kind of uh, now sort of 15, 16 years since I graduated as a lawyer at UQ. Um, um, highlights or where to begin? Well, as I say, I, I'll sort of start where we are now. I've got a, a legal recruitment business based in Brisbane where we predominantly recruit for lawyers um, in the Brisbane market, but also um, certainly at least again, post COVID and before COVID uh, overseas is picking up again. Um, I, uh, I graduated my law degree in 2004 and um, wasn't sure at the time whether or not I wanted to be a lawyer or not. So I thought um, I'd just take a year off and, and sort of try and work out what might be uh, my next plan. Um, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, we decided to uh, go via Japan where we taught English for six months and then uh, arrived in London, um, not really with necessarily with any plans, but maybe just a, an opportunity to sort of see what was out there. Yeah. I, uh, I fell into recruitment working for a big global agency over there. Um, and in hindsight, it was, uh, it was a hell of a lot of fun. It was sort of pre-GFC days. Um, and uh, it ended up being the best part of five years away that I was uh, that I was overseas. Um, as you mentioned before, um, my role initially focused on contract work in the regulatory space. Obviously, financial services in London is a big thing. And then uh, moved into the legal recruitment team, where a lot of what I was doing was actually headhunting Australian lawyers to go and um, work in the UK. Um, that sort of uh, came to an end when we got married. We decided we'd move back to Australia, had a year-long honeymoon, which was a lot of fun, uh, which coincided with the GFC. So it was actually pretty good timing and came back to Australia. And I thought, you know what, I'll give law a practice, you know, give practice of, yeah. of law a go. And so I had two years doing that, um, which I must admit, it, was, uh, it probably wasn't for me, um, the actual practice of law, um, having gone from very much sort of a client-facing role to uh, being a graduate again, and um, living a life in six minute units um, it was a bit of a challenge, but um, I, uh, I ended up getting back into recruitment and um, um, sort of for the last sort of 12, 13 years here in Brisbane, um, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Okay, so um, never kind of wanted to go back into practice or not? not yeah, to I, it's, it's funny, you know, I think maybe my, um, my judgment was perhaps a little bit clouded. Um, with law having recruited in the UK sort of pre-GFC, seeing um, the incredible hours that were worked by lawyers, um, particularly in the big US firms in London at the time. And I thought, you know what, I don't particularly want to do that. When I come back here to Brisbane, uh, newly married, had a young family and um, 
uh, you know, time had moved on, I think, for me at that stage. Um, and so I was cognizant of the fact I wanted to practice law, but I wanted to work in a smaller law firm where um, you, you tend to see a lot more probably than you would otherwise in perhaps a, a top tier. Um, and it's quite funny, you know, um, if I'd had perhaps my time again, um, and my business partner, Peter, he's actually an Allen's lawyer by training. Um, he often says he'd still be a lawyer if he was in a small firm. Um, conversely, I'd probably be a lawyer if I was in a top tier firm. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things in, in life and with law that you don't quite know what you've got um, until you actually try it. No, no. Um, but kind of interesting, though, like having worked as a lawyer and then being a recruiter, you yeah. would really know firsthand what companies are looking for as absolutely. well. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, you know, when you look at CVs for a living, as I like to say, um, it certainly wasn't a career that I had in mind when I finished um, my law degree. Um, it was, as I say, it was only going to be a year long um, adventure, which sort of turned into, you know, by the time we got home, almost five years. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so we talked about just going overseas and exploring the world at the time um, yeah. or a few countries rather than an actual intentional, deliberate desire to go and work overseas. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think, you know, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You could do it, you know, the, the sort of the carefree way, which is what um, my wife or girlfriend at the time and I did. Um, which is just to go there and just see what happens um, with no real sort of open-ended plan, but, you know, with a view of obviously always coming back to Australia. Um, or you could do it um, perhaps more traditional way, which is to get some experience under your belt um, and then use that when you get to a different market. Um, so there's definitely two ways of going about it. Um, and I don't think either's right or wrong. Um, they're both a heck of a lot of fun, um, or at least they should be. That's the whole idea, right? Yeah, no, definitely. So if you um, had wanted to practice when you were mm -hmm. over in the UK, how hard would that have been? Uh, for me, well, as a law graduate, very, um, quite simply because um, I'd be up against all the other law graduates from all the other UK universities. And um, oh. and so that, that that is something that I would obviously caution against. You know, if you wanted to go and practice as a lawyer in the UK, um, my suggestion is you've got to get runs on the board before you um, even contemplate going over there and, uh, and trying to practice as a lawyer, um, certainly practicing as a lawyer. That's not to say you, you wouldn't get opportunities possibly, um, you know, in support type roles within law firms or, or corporates. But I would suggest if you're going to practice law, you need to be admitted here in Australia as well. So admitted plus maybe a couple of years post admission experience in a particular practice area yeah. or generalist, what do you think? No, generally at least two years post-admission experience, um, you know, and the reason for that is because the way the, the way Australian lawyers, um, or indeed Commonwealth lawyers uh, more generally are viewed in the UK is, um, is you, you tend to sort of take two years of your post-admission experience off and you're considered then a newly qualified mm -hmm. lawyer in the UK. So, you know, if you're a four-year lawyer, here in Australia, uh, for all intents and purposes in the UK, firms will consider you a two-year lawyer. Um, yeah. So um, my suggestion would be probably you want to sort of start looking at least with sort of two years, possibly three before, um, you know, taking the plunge. Right. And any particular experience do you yeah. think would be useful? Would it be more Absolutely. useful like if you were coming from, say, working in a private more commercial firm versus say working in government or is it more about the individual oh look there's a bit of that i i think you know if um the um look there is no right answer i sort of look at what my experience was i had no experience when i turned up overseas mm -hmm. with, i think i had two work two two weeks worth of work experience um um, in the legal department of a large corporate um, of all places in Sydney and, and found a job in London. Um, I think if you're a lawyer coming over, um, traditionally, you want to be in one of those sort of front end transactional, you know, practice areas, you know, whether it be corporate or banking or um, projects or construction, um, mm. simply because, you know, a lot of the law is very similar. I think, you know, the challenge for litigators, for example, it's a lot harder, you know, it's a different rule book, you know, we have different um procedural rules and and the like you know in different states of australia they're different in the uk um so you know where a lot of australian lawyers have really sort of found a very easy sort of path over is if you are from a well-regarded 
larger firm. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be top tier, but at least a large firm. And in practice areas with transferable skills, as I say, you know, corporate in particular, um, construction uh, projects and, and so forth. Um, that's not to say, and look, there's plenty of examples also of, you know, employment lawyers and, and the like, but, you know, I think it, it's a stretch for, um, say, family lawyers or criminal lawyers, perhaps, to, uh, to make the move yeah. over. Um, um, and, and this is, I, I'll point out, Susan, I think, you know, um, a lot of lawyers and, you know, being the risk averse types that we are, um, we're always looking for red flags. You know, a lot of lawyers want to get jobs lined up before they go, um, and that's absolutely fine. That's understandable. Um, but that's really sort of limited to, you know, the big firms that are used to, be, you know, Australians coming over um, and in those sort of particular practice areas. Um, if you're a planning environment lawyer, it's going to be hard. If you're, you know, um, as I say, a family lawyer or a criminal lawyer, it's going to be very hard. And um, it's not to say it can't be done, but you know, yes. just think that you're going to get a job lined up before you go over. I think it's um, a stretch. Right. So it kind of would be more easier than if you were in a firm that perhaps even had global offices, and then you could do a secondment or, or, uh, or yeah. go that there, way. There, there is that. There is that. The other thing, um, and look, this is again is, and again, it's <laughs> um, for lawyers throwing caution to the wind is always, um, you know. Um, a, bit of a challenge but I think there's, there's no there'd be absolutely no harm in in sort of ripping the band-aid off and actually just going over there and just giving it a go because yeah often, often and I see this as a recruiter these days often a, a, an employer will come to you um, with a need for a staff member now they come to you with a need because they needed someone yesterday um, if you can't get to the UK or wherever it might be for let's say you know, four weeks notice with your current employer, two weeks to sort of pack up, two, you know, you're looking at two months, three months, you know, sometimes, you know, time has sort mm. of moved by. Whereas if you find yourself in the UK, and I'm using this as an example, immediately available, then, you know, for any employer, they're like, well, perfect. You know, if your visa's there and you're ready to go, um, you're one step ahead of the competition anyway. That's a huge, huge, huge fillet for anyone um, who's actually yeah. actively looking for work. If you're immediately available, that straight away puts you to the front of the queue. Um, okay. and yeah, as I say. Yeah, it, so just, just kind of go for it, <laughs> you're saying. Oh, I think don't, so. Don't over, overthink it. And I suppose it oh, also depends on the, your situation, your circumstances, if you're looking at going on your own versus if you've got a, a whole family that's going over with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I agree. I mean, it is, it is a big ask. There's no question. Mm. But... Um, I've seen so many incredible success stories of, and certainly of mates of mine, you know, who did a similar thing, um, who didn't have a job when they arrived over in the UK um, and just started pounding the pavement. And um, it's a, I always sort of say it's a full-time job looking for a job anyway, or at least it should be. Um, but when you're in a different city and you're sort of running out of uh, pounds very quickly, um, there's an added incentive to try and find a job uh, very, very quickly. So... In terms of how the market works over there with the whole idea of kind of networking being very important, would you suggest that people utilise their networks here to, to kind of start networking with people over there or would you do it once you got there? Would you join any associations or institutes or how do you navigate that if you don't maybe have um, a huge network overseas, which I imagine a lot of people might not? Yeah, a lot of people don't, and I don't think there's the same, perhaps, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't think there seems to be the same sort of emphasis on the need for a network. I think the network you mm. want when you get to any new um, any new town or any new city is to have some familiar, you know, accents or uh, voices um, that you can talk to in person. I think um, uh, scratch a bit deeper, and I'm sure you'd know someone who knows someone who might be able to, you know, put you on... On, on the couch for a week or whatever it might be. And people are generally very accommodating when you first arrive if, as I say, you don't have a job lined up, for example. Um, but in terms of sort of, um, you know, actively pursuing sort of networks, I think those sorts of things come once you're there. Um, uh, you've got to remember, and I think, you know, this is, this is where 
um, it was it's a rite of passage for so many Australian young professionals, and it's not just limited to lawyers, it's other professionals, whether it be accountants or those who work in finance, you know, going overseas is a great opportunity, but um, particularly, say, for legal, um, Australian lawyers um, and indeed New Zealand lawyers are really well regarded in the UK for, for one main reason is they're often well trained, um, which, is a, which is a start. Um, two, they can join a firm and are, again, um, generally profitable um, uh, seat, you know, like a, a profitable employee because, you know, they can charge up um, and they understand how law firm economics works. Um, but the critical one is that they're often only there for sort of, let's say, two, three, maybe four years um, as a lawyer and then they head back to Australia. Now, the beauty of that, of course, is that it doesn't put any noses out of joint when you're, you know, chasing partnership, for example, in a, in a big firm. You know, there may be sort of some local um, employees who might sort of think, well, hang on, you know, these Australians are taking our jobs, you know, and they, you can get sucked into sort of the, the politics of, say, a law firm environment. Australian lawyers aren't like that. So they're just there to work hard, earn good money, have a good time, and then leave without, you know, having the tricky questions of, all right, what's next partnership? Are you staying? Or um, And sure, there are, there are no shortage. I mean, you only have to jump onto um, the websites of a lot of the big firms in London to see no shortage of Australian and New Zealand lawyers that have ended up actually staying there um, and are partners of, you know, of these big magic circle firms or US firms to, to show that, you know, some people never come back. But by and large, um, you know, they're great, they're viewed as great employees because, you know, they work hard and, and want to have fun and, and won't get in the road uh, when it comes to chasing partnership. Okay. All right. Oh, that's good to know. Um, so what, um, in terms of like looking for opportunities, what type of, um, where, how would you, would you do that through recruitment firms like yourselves yeah. or would you go online yeah. and do it? Like where, what's the best way to try and find those roles? Yeah, for sure. And again, I think it also all comes back down to, you know, where you're currently working at the moment. If, as I say, you know, if you're a, let's say a three-year corporate M&A lawyer working for a top-tier firm in Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne or Perth or Adelaide doing quality work, then there's a very real likelihood that you'll be able to secure a job before you go. Um, my advice would be to partner with one, maybe two recruiters and sort of get a real good understanding of who are the right firms, you know, in that market to uh, to approach. Um, and then the rest is pretty much all done. Um, you know, the beauty of it these days is um, so easy to interview with Zoom and Teams and, and other, you know, video conferencing facilities. So that's not a problem at all. Um, the challenge, of course, comes back to what practice area you are practicing yeah. in. Um, now, um, I mentioned before, you know, litigators, generally speaking, that's quite hard. Um, that's not to say, you know, there's good jobs in the, you know, in offshore jurisdictions like um, the Cayman Islands or, um, you know, the Channel Islands, if, uh, if you want to live in the English Channel for a little while. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, insurance and, uh, sorry, uh, litigation and, you know, other sort of um, non-front-end practice areas, it is, it is a bit more of a challenge. Um, and my advice to, to lawyers in that situation would be, you know, um, possibly just get there and give it a go. Um, I know it's easier said than done, but once, as I say, you are there, it is a full-time job looking for a job and you'd be amazed at the opportunities that tend to open up. For lawyers who have worked in, you know, government or probably who have worked in, you know, smaller firms here that, you know, um, won't necessarily get a look in. You know, I mean, I'd always sort of say, if you're a suburban solicitor um, doing general commercial, you know, sales and acquisitions of, you know, small businesses, you know, is it likely that you're going to get a job working for a big, you know, Wall Street firm in London? I would say no. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, but there's no shortage of uh, other legal opportunities in the UK as well. And I think, you know, you can't look past areas like, you know, for example, if London was the place you wanted to be, you know, to go and work for one of the many borough councils over there. Um, there's lots of Australian and New Zealand lawyers that would work in, 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 those, um, in those places. Likewise, what would those roles kind of be then? 
Oh, look, anything from sort of just doing general commercial contracting um, for, for a mm -hmm. borough council to, um, you know, some disputes work, I guess. Um, you know, and you look, the salaries are going to be nowhere near what you're going to get working oh, yes. for, for, for the big firms. The, that there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, you won't be working weekends and you won't be working until sort of 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Um, you know, it'll be an 8.30 to 5.30 job and you can use that extra time to either go to the pub or go traveling, you know? So yeah. it, it is it is what you want, you know, it is what you make of it. Um, right, okay. Well, that's, um, that's also good to know because not everyone is going to come from those um, ideal kind of grounds and backgrounds no, sure. that you're talking about. And, um, and then, sorry, and the other thing also is worth pointing out, you know, there's also a much better contracting market, um, I would say, in the, in, the, in the UK as well. So, um, again, it might be, you know, working on, I don't know, again, depending on experience, you know, like a big discovery matter for, you know, a client, you know, for a law firm where you might work for, you know, fresh fields on one matter for four months on an hourly rate, um, finish that go traveling for two months, come back and find another one somewhere else. And, and so there's all sorts of different options. Now, um, I could go down a rabbit hole of, are they good for your experience? Um, that's a moot point. You know, again, as someone who looks at CVs, I'd sort of suggest it depends on what you want out of your career anyway. If you wanted to chase partnership at a top tier firm, probably wouldn't do any good, but I think, you know, it's all about having an experience, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's all about the way you pitch it as well. And there'd be a lot of skills that you would take away from those experiences, which are um, more life skills as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So just a, a couple of last questions. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of then what individuals can do to position themselves now, yeah. Apart from the different experiences and opportunities where they may be working, is there any other particular skills or knowledge they could be working on or building that might um, be yeah. impressive overseas? Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I think, and this is certainly advice I give to any job seeker, whether they're Australian, whether they're overseas or, or the like, I think every single lawyer um, has their own unique situation um, and you've really got to sort of focus on what is it you want out of your career anyway I mean is it to go to the UK to actually improve your career and sort of get ahead on the ladder or I'm sorry if I keep using the UK as an example but you know it's the same if you go to Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever it might be or the Middle East you know why are you going overseas um, and you can certainly further your career by going overseas you know don't get me wrong um, you can also make it very hard to come back um yeah. from overseas like it's quite interesting i've got a very good friend of mine who was out from the uk she's a general counsel of um of a large international corporate um based in the uk and it's actually a real challenge for her to find something mm. good that will pay well back in australia she's desperately keen to come back but um it's, it's a real challenge so um, yeah shot the lights out over there but um is, is now finding it hard to come back so yeah uh, so but going back to your your initial question i think not so much is there anything you can do to get yourself overseas it's why you're going overseas in the mm -hmm. first place um and that's a question you probably need to ask you know, as a lawyer you need to ask yourself yeah um, yeah because if you know what you want to do in your career you'll know whether it's a good idea as to whether or not it's worth going over or you could end up like me where, you know, you didn't really have any idea of uh, why you were going overseas just because you just knew you didn't want to practice law straight away and you fall into something totally different. Um, yes. In my case, recruitment. And um, it was only a sort of a stopgap me measure and I never really took it seriously until I got over there and went, actually, you know what, I kind of like this job. Um, uh, there's times where I hate this job, but I think people could say that about every job, right? Um, and um, and then came back and thought, right, now's my time to practice law. Um, and I'm glad I did. Uh, it's yes. sort of, a lot of suspicions that were in my mind anyway. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, I think if if you want to go overseas, you'll know why you want to go overseas. Um, yes. I'd highly recommend it. I think it was certainly looking back at it, it was um, some of the best years of my life. You know, I saw an incredible amount. Um, learned a lot professionally. 
Um, oh, okay. Had some incredible meetings, um, you know, going to some of my in-house clients, you know, whether it was you know, Goldman Sachs on Fleet Street's office or, you know, wow. the global yep. of legal for some of the big banks over there or, um, you know, and I was still in my 20s and not really quite sure <laughs> what I was doing at half of these places. But, um, yeah, it was certainly a life experience and one I'll never forget. Yeah, definitely. And it makes for just such a, a, a much more kind of richer and colourful experience as well, doesn't it? And it kind of yeah. makes it stand out when you are yeah. telling your 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 story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last question. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self, even though to me it sounds like you did the best thing, but is there any kind of regrets or anything else yeah. that you would say to those people that are maybe just sitting on the on the border. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, um, law law is um, law is a funny profession. If if um, if there's anything I've seen um, over the last sort of I don't know fifteen plus years and almost twenty years since I graduated, um, it is a hyper hyper competitive profession. Um, it's not like what you see on TV. Um, speak to anyone who's been in practice of law, and it's it's a hard, hard slog. There's no shortcuts. Um, it's not a profession you can knock off at 5.30 and just, you know, wash your hands and, and think, all oh, right, I'm done, walk away for the weekend. Um, it's the younger me, perhaps. Um, it's, a, it's a really hard question. I mean, I guess I, I am pretty happy with where I'm at at the moment. I, I do enjoy what I do, I do, I do enjoy talking to lawyers about their careers and sort of seeing some of the mistakes people have made. Other, I say other mistakes. I think you know, law is a pretty unforgiving profession. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to make a mistake and then make up for it. I think you're allowed one mistake on your CV. Two, you start asking questions, and three, there's alarm bells from any perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I always sort of say to lawyers, be very careful about every move that you make because one of the first questions that you'll ever get asked in an interview is, why did you leave your last job? It doesn't happen if you're an IT contractor. It doesn't happen if you're a mm -hmm. um, accounts payable person. It doesn't, you know, there's, but when you, if you're a lawyer, every job you have, you have to explain why you left your previous one. Um, and if you don't have good, solid, sound reasons as to why, it's going to make, you know, a prospective employer really think twice about employing you. So um, what would be my younger <laughs> regret? <laughs> um Maybe, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 maybe, 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 maybe if I, maybe if I, well, maybe if I'd worked, well, if I'd probably worked harder um, at uni and got better marks, um, you know, um, who knows where I might have been. I think I, you know, what we used to call jokingly back then a gentleman's degree. Um, uh, and, and I perhaps didn't sort of push my career hard enough early on. Um, but if I had, I might have been somewhere else. Who knows where? Um, yeah, maybe not even in law. <laughs> maybe not even in law. Maybe not even law. At least sort of loosely associated with it. But um, um, but I think you know again, if if I can give any advice, perhaps to sort of younger lawyers, is that you know you 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 can't do the job half pregnant for for better word. You know you've mm. you've got to you've got to be committed. In fact, I, some of the best advice I ever got um, from from someone who is very close to me, um, who is uh, for all intents and purposes, a very successful lawyer or has a very successful legal, had had a very successful legal career, has moved into, you know, an executive senior role in a large Australian business. And he said to me very early on, I think it was about fourth year uni, he said, um, if you don't love the law, law's not for you. And I remember at the time, it sort of really yeah. seared in my mind. He said, the best lawyers are the ones that are absolutely, absolutely passionate about the job. Um, and it's true. Unfortunately, I do speak to a lot of lawyers who are unhappy, um, mm. who, who probably did law because they thought it was, you yeah. know, it sounded good. But I think, you know, if you're really going to love being a lawyer, you've got to love the law. Um, yeah. I, um, I, I love to talking to lawyers. I love talking to, to you know, because there's a lot of smart people out there that do do law. Yeah. Um, you know, there's people, you know, who might have been pretty average at maths and science like what I was, but considered myself reasonably intelligent um, and probably thought, well, I'll do law because at least it still sounds good, um, but never had the driving passion perhaps to be a lawyer. Um, yeah, but it's kind of nice that you're still um, working in that space and you're still yeah. working with lawyers and aspiring yeah. lawyers. So um, right, and it's, 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 you know, that's 
that's a great, great kind of happy medium. Yeah, it is great. And look, there's a, there's a lot to like about the law. I think, you know, you can really sort of, um, you can bring change. Um, there's a lot of good life skills, I think, mm. that you get out of being a lawyer. I think don't ever sort of, um, you know, underestimate what skills you, you, you can achieve by getting a law degree and becoming a lawyer. Um, but I think, you know, if it's going to be your profession moving forward, understand that it is a challenging one. It's, it's, um, mm. it's one that requires a lot of hard work and, um, um, and it doesn't necessarily pay that well. That's the, that's the other interesting thing. Yes. Um, the pay is getting a lot better in Australia. Um, it's certainly with, compared to us, compared to overseas, um, you, know, you know, Australian lawyers, I think, are massively underpaid. Um, but again, you know, there's plenty of other avenues you can take your career with a law degree, that's for sure. Okay, no, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, a big, a big thank you to you, um, Ross, for kind of sharing your insights and your experience. I think um, it's, I really kind of appreciate your honesty and um, some really good insights that you've got from being in the profession as well. So thank no, you. Good. And um, it will be good uh, to help people kind of think about their decisions and maybe yeah. not overthink. Maybe they just also need to have a little bit of a Nike in them too. Oh, I think so, yeah. I think yeah. I'm going to say one last thing, as I say, if you're sort of umming and ahhing um, about going overseas, it probably means that you do want to go deep down. Um, but don't let, you know, the red flags of not having a job or a place to stay get in your road. I think looking back, I had none of those. Um, yeah. I wasn't going to go there for long and it just opened up, you know, it opens up a whole new different world of opportunity um, when you're outside your comfort zone. And uh, as I say, I, I, I look back and go, it's probably the best thing we ever did. Um, yes. And um, who knows where, as I say, uh, your, your legal career can take you um, overseas. You might have to do another stint, Ross. No. <laughs> yeah, I've got, three, I've got three young girls. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'd have to drag with me. Um... No, maybe just a holiday then. <laughs> yeah, going to get old for that, but no, uh, no, maybe a holiday. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks I'm Susan. just going to just um, say no goodbye worries. to you now. Appreciate that. I am excited to welcome our second speaker, Helen Wu, who joins us or joins me from San Francisco. A little bit about Helen. Welcome, Helen. Um, thanks. A little bit about you. So Helen completed a Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Commerce at the University of New South Wales and her Masters of Law at the University of Sydney. She started her early career as an associate for Justice Carolyn Simpson in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, moving across to private practice as a commercial and litigation lawyer with DLA, DLA Piper in Sydney for four years. She then moved to work at in-house legal teams, including I Corp and Orbit's Asia Pacific, before she moved abroad to the US around 2014, where she worked with JetBlue Airways as their commercial IP and advertising council team based in New York City for three and a half years. She has been since with PlayStation from mid-2018 as their director, business and legal affairs, marketing and advertising council based in San Francisco. Helen is a member of the State Bar of New York and registered in-house counsel of California, USA. Her areas of exper expertise are diverse and many and include commercial co transactions, complex, intellect intellectual property strategy advice, global trademark portfolio management and protection, privacy and data protection, technology and software contracts, social media, marketing and advertising law, online content, advising on platforms, terms and conditions, promotional and advertising copy, risk management. That's a lot. <laughs> you must be so busy, Helen. <laughs> well, so, I'm going to so, start with really important. That's why it's really important to keep your LinkedIn profile up to date because a lot of that was from there. It's going back, going back to the early stages of your career as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so Helen, just first question, perhaps if you can just give us a, an overview of your career 
and just maybe tell us about a couple of your your sure happy to do that so uh just to add a bit more uh information to the introduction you provided for me i enjoyed uh, my school and university years here, but I have always wanted to move overseas. And I don't know if it's because I've always loved to travel as an individual or with my family or with friends. But um, when I started university, I knew that I would go and work overseas at some point. Um, so I, well, I did what I think a lot of Australians do or did do, um, which is when I finished law school, um, after I did that combined bachelor's and uh, commerce degree, um, I spent two years in London. So that was the first thing. I um, was not actually in a rush to join, um, start working really at a law firm or anywhere else. So I went off to London and, and got that out of my system. What I did when I was in London, I hadn't yet um, completed the College of Law or gotten my practicing certificate. So I did a number of paralegal roles. Um, I worked at some in-house companies, including Xerox UK, the London Borough of Enfield Council, um, they were all in paralegal type roles, um, which was a great introduction to in-house activity. Then I moved back to Sydney and I actually applied for and started my um, work as a tip staff or associate to Justice Simpson. Um, and I looked for that role because I was really interested in seeing that perspective from the other side of the bench. Um, it's one of those few times, I think, as a young lawyer between starting work at a firm or starting anywhere that you can actually work with a judge. And that was hugely beneficial to get to see um, what it's like inside a judge's chambers, um, working on research, drafting, reviewing judgments, um, and just speaking even to judges and barristers and getting exposure to all of that. Um, so I really enjoyed that first the, the year or it was about 10 months that I'd uh, worked with Justice Simpson. And that, that naturally led me to pursue a career in litigation. Um, so then I started work at DLA Piper, which um, for those who are old enough like me to remember was previously Phillips Fox. Um, and so this kind of leads into the discussion of pursuing an international career because kind of by coincidence or chance, Phillips Fox, while I was working there was um, became part of DLA Piper, which of course is a big American law firm. So already on my resume, there is a name or a company that American employers could recognize. At the, you know, and I hadn't planned that. So I, I want to say that part of everything that happened to me is a bit of luck. Um, yeah, a little bit um, circumstantial, definitely. That's just so, yeah, really um, important. This is the next piece. So... <laughs> um, you know, I enjoyed working at Daily Piper. I had an amazing team. Um, it was the Commercial Disputes Resolution Group, which is essentially litigation. And that meant I was exposed to a broad range of litigation, a whole range of things from commercial contract disputes um, to marketing issues, IP issues. It wasn't just a narrow litigation group. Um, during that time, I started to look for in-house roles and I got my first in-house role at a company called iCorp. Again, for those who remember, um, that company existed. It was owned by Channel 10 or Network 10 um, and then was acquired and became out of home. Um, so they're an outdoor advertising agency, outdoor media company. So I really enjoyed that as my first in-house role. Um, and that was difficult to, to obtain for those people who are looking at, firstly, how do you transition from a law firm to in-house? You know, I look back at that now that I've been in-house for you know, over a decade, nearly, well, not two decades, over a decade, I look back on that and it, it was harder than I realised. I don't think I was a great in-house counsel. Hopefully my boss then begs to differ. But, um, you know, it's, it's really a challenging thing. So there's that leap. And I won't even go into the whole back conversation of whether you need to be in a law firm before you go in-house. I don't think you do, but it definitely helps to get all that training. So I moved in-house for a year at i -Corp before I found um, a role that I, I wanted that was more broader in scope. So at that role, I was looking at leases, I was looking at uh, advertising and, and what was being done for outdoor advertising in malls, in airports, billboards, those things. So I found a role at what was known as Hotel Club which is actually um, the Asia Pacific division of orbits.com, which is now um, probably better known as part of Expedia. 
So it's okay. been, yeah, it, it fit a lot of my um, things <clears throat> I was interested in. So another thing I guess I've been guided by is always looking for industries or consumer products that I enjoy and I relate to. Um, so I didn't, uh, as you can tell from this story, I hadn't yet really touched marketing and advertising law, which is what my expertise are now. So at that point, um, I was still looking to find which area of law do I want to focus on and do I want to specialize in. And that particular role meant that I was, again, working in an Australian office based in Sydney for an American company. So I was the only legal person based in Sydney and I had to cover all of APAC and I was not even 30. So I was in my 20s with all that responsibility and I highly recommend it to anyone because I wouldn't have done it any differently because it really was a sink or swim situation. I'm, I'm suddenly responsible for all these different countries. I was flying around to different parts of Asia and advising on different things, working. Um, and I was what you call a generalist, um, doing all different kinds of law. I had to advise on employment, on IP, on contracts. Um, on corporate filings and I had to I was forced to learn American laws and become familiar mm -hmm. with certain things because the legal team was actually based in Chicago where Orbit's headquarters was and I think so were you is. were you just on your own in this in the Sydney office doing that that yes. it was you just you yeah. okay reporting into the US yeah <laughs> I was the sole lawyer and I had um, my reporting structure was to someone in the US with a dotted line to the president of Hotel Club and he was based in Sydney. And that was a big learning experience wow. because the other, thing, the other thing that I was thrown into, which I didn't realise, was to be part of the SLT or what they call the senior leadership team. So for the first time, I am with C-suite people. I've got the chief marketing officer, the CMO there, the CTO, technology officer, the CFO, the chief finance officer, myself. Um, as, and my actual title was senior counsel. It wasn't a chief legal officer um, and the um, president of the company. So we, we formed the SLT and it meant that we were reviewing and having meetings with all the other groups. But having that exposure to senior leadership people and understanding the strategy and the decision-making was really invaluable. So I, I, would, I would consider that a big turning point and highlight in my career. And I'll fast forward because I'm, I'm talking um, a long time about these things so um that role came to an end after a couple of years eventually they decided to have the legal team consolidated so my role actually became redundant which was a very difficult process for me personally mm -hmm. um, and I think for anyone who has lost their job um, but what it also meant was that in the back of my mind someday I wanted to move to New York and so that someday became that day uh, pretty much very shortly after that happened, um, I applied to uh, complete the New York Bar exam. I applied to do Barbary, which is the course to help you study for that. There's a whole number of courses that you can apply to study for any bar exam in America. So I did the Barbary course, which is essentially for those who are thinking about it or who know about it. It's a two month course and every single day they tell you what you're going to do. So that really helped me discipline myself when I was out of work and I had two full months to study for this. Um, I do have some friends who work full time and study for it and that's extremely hard, but crazy advice because everything was hanging on that exam. So six months later, I fly to New York, get a ticket, take the exam, and then I come back and anxiously await the result you know, one or two months later. And I thought, if this doesn't work, I need to start looking for a job. <laughs> Um, in Sydney so you know it was a really interesting time and and it came out that I did pass and pretty much after I found out I passed within two weeks I was out of here and I and so for those people who are thinking about doing that I mean I actually just flew to America and I didn't I knew a handful of people and contacts having worked at those two companies um, and visited Chicago a lot when I was at um, hotel club and orbits and and I just started reaching out to networks and and trying to set up phone meetings or in-person meetings with people just to talk about having a career internationally um, with that line of I'm a lawyer from Sydney I'm really interested in learning about your company your industry one of those casual do you have five minute chats um, and 
So, so you didn't have a, a role lined up or anything. You you decided that you were just going to go over there and then position yourself and start talking to people in the profession to see what opportunities were there. Exactly. So it was a calculated yeah. risk, yeah. It is. Um, yeah. A lot of people might say it's better to have something lined up. And, of course, in an ideal world it is to have hmm. a job visa lined up and I had neither. I just right. knew that I wanted to get on the ground and start talking to people um, and see what happens. Um, and eventually, actually, a role did come out of that. And my first um, role based in New York after I passed the exam, I actually didn't start till a year after I had finished my other job. So there is a gap in my resume of about a year, which I have to explain to people. And that was at MRY. It was an ad agency. So this is when I really started to hone my skills in marketing and advertising and IP law. So um, I worked with um, general counsel. It was just him and me, a team of two. Um, and MRY is an ad, ag ad agency owned by Publicis, um, which is a big international firm. Um, so that was great exposure, working with a whole range of brands. At the time, we had clients like Visa, Johnson & Johnson. They were big household names. And, you know, that was a really interesting time. And I realized how much I enjoyed working with creative people and creative teams to help them realize visions, um, being a fan of the arts myself. So, you know, that, that was really fun, reviewing a lot of ads, reviewing marketing copy, working on disclaimers, looking at video content. Um, and learning a lot about working with social media law, um, which is not something I studied back in the day at New South or, or Sydney. It wasn't really a topic, social media law. But really, at this agency, there was a strong focus on social, on working with influencers. And I really um, learned a lot about that then. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was looking again to broaden my scope. Um, and I've always kept an eye on things related to travel. So uh, an airline um, opportunity arose in JetBlue, which is um, essentially a domestic US carrier. They also fly to London now, Mexico and some LATAM countries. But um, I started working at JetBlue as the sole marketing and advertising council there. Um, and I guess my, my interest led me there because again, it was travel and I, it was definitely one of the highlights of my career. Um, I'm just going to say free unlimited travel benefits. I think it was um, it was working with the biggest team legal team that I had worked with today. So there were about 25, 30 lawyers. Um, there were specialists in all these different areas like litigation, employment. So it was the first time I'd had that exposure. Yeah, and it worked a lot on your own. Yeah, so you had a lot of like responsibility on your shoulders. So it probably would have been lovely to be part of a big team. Exactly. Actually, I hadn't mm. thought about it it that way that yeah as I'm describing things I'd always been on my own or with one person yeah. a general counsel. yeah, yeah so you were often thrown into things yeah so you had to get up to speed very quickly exactly so mm. um I really enjoyed that role for a couple of years and of course loved living in New York City because that was mm. always my dream I always wanted to live in New York and then some four or so years later an opportunity came up at PlayStation um, so I'm not admittedly a gamer, um, but I have family who are, but what I do love is interesting, innovative law. And in terms of advertising, I think certain industries, whether it's airlines or, um, other ones who are more resource constrained, uh, are not always doing the most dynamic advertising, but a tech company is really forward in looking at things like AI, VR, AR, all those things. So I just saw some opportunity to really push the boundaries on, on my knowledge and the next stage of law and tech. And that is obviously based in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. So I, I took a leap of faith. I was very reluctant to leave New York City. Um, and uh, so to work in-house there, I didn't need to do a bar exam because I'm not appearing before court. So I registered as in-house counsel and I started this role um, at PlayStation where I am now and it's been three or so years um, and now I'm the director of marketing and advertising law globally so really enjoying that opportunity at the moment and and working with um, not only the team um, at PlayStation based in San Mateo but the global PlayStation team and part of the larger Sony Corp um, business in Japan so that's, that's a little long story 
It is, but it's a it's a fascinating story, and there were like like it was also a lot of kind of happenstance coming into it, but your experience lent itself um, to each kind of new position as well. So if you reflect now, do you think it would have made a difference if you went and started your overseas career earlier? Or do you feel like having that experience um, in Australia, in Sydney, where you got exposed to different areas in law, set you up and kind of maybe gave you a little bit more confidence as you progressed um, in a different country, different jurisdictions? Yeah, that is a great question. I think that having the experience helped. Um, and when I say having the experience, it's having the experience of working as a lawyer in a law firm and in-house. Because I know as a hiring manager now, and I've built out a team at PlayStation, it was non-existent before in terms of marketing. It was just me and my boss. I now have two direct reports and a team of six um, who work on marketing with me. So I know as a hiring manager, I look for that in people's resumes who apply. Um, that they have solid experience. In so what, what type of skills would you look for in your role now, like in terms of then um, the, the critical skills that perhaps um, lawyers or new lawyers need to be developing to actually position themselves for a, a career? What are some of the kind of critical skills do you think that are, are important that you would you would be looking at on CVs? Yeah, I'll answer that question in regards to my lens, which is more mm. an in-house perspective uh, than perhaps someone at a law firm or nonprofit. Yep. Um, I think problem solving is really mm. important. Um, we have very novel problems and issues that arise with the marketing team here. They're, they're always wanting to do all kinds of innovative, creative things that often really do push the boundaries. And that's why I joined, you know, that's what I want, innovative marketing, you know, things that are new and different. And as you know, with all the technologies out there, there's ad tech, there is um, augmented reality things that are happening. Uh, there is a lot of areas that, um, that cross into other areas. So the other thing I would look for is someone who has a general knowledge of a range of laws. So if your expertise are IP or marketing, I, I would want some interest or knowledge or experience in fields like data privacy, because that intersects with a lot of the things I deal with now. Um, I work very closely with product council and that's a role that I didn't see when I was in Australia. It seems more tech forward, but they are council who work very closely on one particular product. So we have product council at PlayStation um, that focus on certain things and they closely align with the business. Mm -hmm. um, so I think adaptability in terms mm. of learning different things is really important. And then the thing that I think is most important is um, someone who can be a strategic partner to the business. So while we have our legal hats on, we are part of a legal business affairs team um, and we need to, we need to, we're asked to provide the legal advice, but sometimes we're also providing other advice with that hat on to sort of ask, you know, what are the different consequences about things? Have you considered negative PR could be an outcome? Have you considered all these other things? So it's, it's all of that. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's really, really useful. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, in terms of the, like kind of getting your head around all the different jurisdictions um, within the US and even going from New York City to San Francisco, was that something that you found difficult or was that something that you, you were able to get your head around fairly quickly? I'd say it was something I could get my head around fairly quickly. There are different laws between the different states and they differ, I think, a lot more than between, say, New South Wales versus Victoria laws. They're really very different. Mm. Um, the area that I work in or focus on the most in terms of marketing and advertising, they're very different. Um, other areas are rights of publicity when we talk about, when people or brands talk about celebrities and things, they're very different. Um, auto renewal laws for subscription products, super different between New York and California. So certain areas are really different, but um, I think when, when you're working in any state, you have an awareness because a lot of advertising is nationwide within the US or it's global in any case. So even when I was working in New York, I was aware that California had stricter laws. So generally the, the MO would have been to apply the highest standards so that you will comply nationwide or 
international if possible around what you say. And they're all generally quite similar in my field of marketing, which is um, no misleading deceptive advertising, no false advertising. So it's it's a very similar concept and theory behind things that I look at and review. In, in terms of like the maybe some of the challenges for you because it sounds like um you absolutely were able to kind of like master it I don't know it sounds like um it it must have been like a a bit of a roller coaster at at times for you like what were some of the more more difficult and challenging times for you when you kind of did make that overseas move yeah, I, I guess the way I've talked about it, I've, I've talked about all the highlights and all the fun. Um, I, I would say it's definitely a lot of hard work and high stress. Uh, mm. you know, the kind of roles I've had are very demanding and they do require you to work extremely hard on and off the clock. There is no real, um, uh, you know, like private time versus work time. Like you can be contacted at any hour. I mean, not that most of the companies I've worked for, they don't, they don't require that. And there's no expectation of that. So for me, I've had to set certain boundaries for myself um, and not create expectations that I'm reachable 24 seven. But obviously the, the kind of roles I've had where you are the sole person or at least someone in a leadership role for a particular challenge. And if I have to cover for that, my team, um, I wanna be the one to step in and say, people who report to me, they, don't, they shouldn't be answering their phones on the weekend. This is up to me. I want to deal with this. So um, it's definitely a lot of hard work. And I think people need to prepare themselves for that. It, I mean, every, every role I've had was extremely difficult to land in the first place as a, as a foreigner, essentially, um, because you need to convince an American employer that you are the best person for the job, better than anyone in their yeah. country or um, who has gone to an Ivy League school or anything like that. It's it's extremely hard to land the job. And once you land the job, that is not the end. That is the beginning. <laughs> then you need to prove yourself and work doubly hard to, um, to prove that you can be the trusted advisor and partner that they're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I could imagine. Um, just a, a couple of other questions about your, your career to date, because it is, it is so fascinating. I was just going to ask you in terms of um, plans from here or even just more general for people like yourself that have established a very successful career overseas, when it comes to coming back to their home country, how difficult is that, do you think, to make that transition, particularly where, um, you know, often you can come back and it can be more difficult to establish yourself in an equally kind of rewarding and um, and, and successful career as well. So how do you think people will kind of manage that? And is that something that you've thought about if you were to ever return back to Australia? Yeah, at the moment, I'm still really enjoying my role um, and my life here. So I haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, I enjoy it so much that I, I see that for the next, you know, short to medium term for sure. Um, so I haven't given a lot of thought um, so I, I can't, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Yeah, question. no, that's okay. Well, it sounds like you've really, you know, it's very settled in the US and, and now that you're in San Francisco as well, it sounds like um, very exciting. In in terms of some other, other questions around um, opportunities, say in the US or anywhere else um, overseas, what would your advice be for people that are interested in traveling, particularly now that things are opening up a little bit? Mm. I go back to, I think, one of my early um, responses, which is around um, reaching out to people and trying to connect with them for five minutes or half an hour. You know, when I was really trying to build networks and explore opportunities um, here uh, before I landed a role, I, I remember going on LinkedIn and looking at all the, I listed out all the companies and, in, um, and industries I was interested in. And I had this crazy Excel sheet <laughs> with like literally 80 lines on it. And I put the name of the company. I looked up the name of the GC and the name of every lawyer in the legal team. And I either personally telephoned them or sent an email. And I got five responses to that 80. <laughs> five, out five out of 80. I, that's quite good. <laughs> 
So five people either wrote me back or picked up the phone, which, you know, so, I mean, expect to deal with a lot of rejection. Um, mm-hmm. People don't have mm-hmm. time here or, or anywhere, right? It's very difficult to cold call and it takes a lot of courage. Um, but that was something I did. And uh, out of those, those five people, I did meet or talk to them and I still remember exactly who they are and I've sent them Christmas cards on occasion to say do you remember me I was that young Australian lawyer and you gave me half an hour of your time and and I've sent them a bottle of wine to say thank you because it's part of you know my life it's really important to focus on building relationships at every stage of your life Um, and I feel like I've continued to do that and it's it's really something Mm -hmm. that I guess comes quite naturally to me because I'm quite extroverted but for those who aren't I think you know, we used to talk about networking. Um, now it's really about building relationships inside and outside of the company. Um, and and having those genuine relationships, I think, make a big difference to, to looking for. Yeah, them. I think that's a really critical point about the, um, the genuineness of that and also the fact that you still keep in contact with those five people that you kind of remember how, how, how they made you feel at that time because you are putting yourself a bit out there and, and it, as you say, um, it can be a bit of a roller coaster of emotions as well. But it's 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 not personal, although sometimes it probably feels personal, I imagine, um, when, you, when you're having those conversations. Um, so just a, a couple of last questions before we finish up. Um, what advice would you give for your younger self? If you were to kind of think back and reflect, would you do things any differently? Or it sounds to me like, you know, it's it's all worked out beautifully. I mean, there's obviously been been um, hiccups along the way, but overall, you've made it work. And through that hard work and determination, um, and endless, um, you know, improving your your knowledge and your expertise and learning as well. There's obviously that theme. Yeah, yeah. And that's, the, I was going to touch on themes. Um, for me, it is continually seeking challenge and adventure. I put adventure in there because, you know, that that is part of my wanderlust travel, um, you know, passion, person speaking, but that applies a lot more broadly too. You know, adventure could be adventure professionally. And for me, that means I've worked in a lot of different legal areas. I went from litigation, my first job actually, um, after after I finished law school, I did have a short stint at Australian Business Lawyer. So I thought I wanted to be an employment lawyer for a time. So I've worked in that, in litigation, as a generalist, in marketing, in IP. So I've worked in different areas of law and I've traversed different industries as well as different continents. And if you're looking to, to mix up all those things, you have to be endlessly flexible and adaptable. And mm-hmm. that's to the circumstances. And it's also... Having the ability, I think, to market yourself is really important. And I understand that better now than I ever have in terms of every day, how do I present to my team? How do I be an effective manager and leader? Like every single thing I do leads down to the team. How do I conduct myself professionally? Do I show up punctually on time? You know, then there's an expectation for others to show up punctually. I just, I'm a lot more mindful and self-aware than I ever was at work. So there are things that I, I wish that maybe I knew earlier, the importance of those things, like how you are seen to be aware of that and how you can project, you know, your culture and your voice um, to others in your team. So do you, do you think that's also part of the area of work that you're in, that there, there is that um, the, the whole social media, that side of things too? Do you think that that has maybe shape that or do you think it's just something that is always important as as a lawyer or really in any profession is that ability to always present yourself in the best light and and you know if you if you do muck up it it stays with you yeah it's a good question I think it relates to any industry Um, yeah I a member of at PlayStation we have women at PlayStation which is um, an e-net or an employee network Um, And I talk with the, I I like to talk with young women or interns and be on panels and give advice like this to encourage and inspire. I think, I think it can really be across any industry or any um, spectrum. Um, But I understand your question because having worked in marketing, I also understand the importance of Mm. what it means to have a brand 
And that can be a personal brand for us. Um, you know, what is your elevator pitch? Mm. Ask, right? Do you have a five minute summary? If you were trapped in an elevator with someone and it's an employer or potential employer, like one day you want to work at this company, how would you sell yourself? Uh, so there are things I think about a lot. And, you know, I guess because I've worked so much on social media and advised on that, I'm more comfortable with it. So I do use that tool. So everyone can find me on LinkedIn um, or other places. Um, but I, I do think that's important. Yeah, I think that that it brings us to a, a conclusion. Um, I feel like there, we could probably talk endlessly about your career as it is so fascinating. And I'm sure that there'll be um, a lot of people who will have more questions. Um, but I just wanted to say a big thank you for making yourself available and just for all the, the, the insights and perspective that you've been able to, to share with me today. Um, I think that it will be just terrific for people to hear that firsthand from someone like yourself who does um, seem to be kind of living a, a dream career. Um, but it really highlights all that you've put into, into where you are now. It sounds like it has not been an, an easy path, um, but it sounds like, you know, you're, you're really enjoying what you're doing now and where you're living. So that's just a lovely, lovely kind of story. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm happy to answer other questions if there are any that come up. All right. Thank you for that. Um, um, I'm now just going to um, just finish the today and we'll speak another time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to our next panellist, who is Olivia Kuhn. And let me just tell you a little bit about Olivia. Welcome, Olivia, by the way. Thank you. So Olivia wears many, many hats as a founding partner, as a litigator, as an arbitrator, as an adjunct professor and a business owner. So Olivia graduated with a law degree with honours from Queen Mary University in London and completed her legal practice course from the University of Exeter in England, correct? Yes. Correct. She qualified as a solicitor in England and Wales in 2003 and Hong Kong in 2012. Prior to establishing Wellington Legal, she worked for several top tier firms in the UK, a leading law firm in Hong Kong and as legal counsel for a listed financial company. Olivia is the co-founder of Wellington Legal, which is a full-service Hong Kong-based law firm with a global perspective and international client base. She is an experienced litigation solicitor who has worked in London and Hong Kong. She enjoys the buzz of litigation and her practice focuses on contentious work. She has acted in litigation matters covering a wide variety of areas, including complex property ownership disputes, director and shareholder disputes, oral and written contract disputes, fraud cases, injunction proceedings, debt recovery, insolvency and bankruptcy. Olivia is also experienced in personal injury and fatal accident claims, as well as criminal defence, where she successfully defended cases which attracted media attention. She is a fellow member of Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators and has acted as counsel in arbitrations. She was appointed as an arbitrator of Guangzhou Arbitration Commission in September 2020. And in September 2018, she was appointed as an adjunct professor of Beijing Normal University. Olivia is currently an officer of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association and was the chair of its Women Business Lawyers Committee from 2018 to 2022. So I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted reading all that. You've, you've packed a lot in. <laughs> Very exciting career. So perhaps some just maybe if you could just take take us through some of the highlights in your career. Um, 
well, I think has to be starting a law firm. It's quite an exciting uh, thing to do. Um, for me, it was a, a, a bit of a, uh, it wasn't planned, to be honest. It's just that um, it wasn't I, uh, no, it wasn't really planned. <laughs> I never planned on opening a law firm <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a chance um, because my current, one of my current partners is actually, um, he was my boss before in a previous law firm I work for. And he approached me and said, hey, so do you want to start a law firm together? And so uh, my other partner, he's also was a partner before in uh, my previous firm. So, so I thought, okay, why not? <laughs> so that's what yeah. happened. You obviously impressed them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> join them. Yeah. So it, it, it was um, a li little bit of timing as well then for you. Yes. Yeah, good timing. Yeah. All right. And um, the idea, tell me a little bit about the transition because you, you did your high school in Hong Kong. And then okay, you, I, yeah. I studied in that. Hong Kong. I studied in Hong Kong until I was 13. And then I went to boarding school in the UK since 14. And then I moved on to do the university uh, also in, in England. And I qualified as a UK solicitor there. And I practiced there for a while before I returned to Hong Kong. In fact, I lived in, I lived in UK for 20 years. <laughs> really? 20 years? Yes. So did you practice as a solicitor in the UK? Yes, I how, did. How long was that for? It was about um, six, seven years. I practiced six, there for, yeah. So what actually took you, I mean, like going to boarding school at 14, that sounds so, so hard, so young to be doing that and being away from family. I, I don't know. But tell me about like what was behind that decision to go to the UK? Where did that come from? Okay, at that point, um, I think it was before 1997. And lots of people migrated away from Hong Kong. It was a kind of like trendy thing to do. And my parents, they said, we're not going to leave Hong Kong. We want to stay here. So, um, but because my dad, he used to work for the government. So uh, he thought uh, we get subsidy for sending kids to abroad to study. So he said, okay, why, why don't you go to UK? I thought, hey, that sounds fun. So that's what that's what happened. I the only thing I actually before I went to UK, I had never been <laughs> never been to this country, and all I did was reading. I read some books by Anna Blyton. I, I remember it's called Mallory, Mallory Towers. Yes, those like boarding school books, those little novels. And I thought really interesting. They get to have like midnight feasts and stuff. So oh. let's let's do that. So it sounded quite romantic then. So yes. did your family did your family come they came with you then or did they stay in Hong Kong? They stayed in Hong Kong. Right, gosh, you must have been one courageous gut, gutsy 14-year-old. Well, in the Blighton said it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> must be right. <laughs> what about like language and, and the cultural differences? Um, Maybe more I think, adaptable, I, do you think, being younger? Oh. I think in terms of languages, it wasn't too bad because um, in, in Hong Kong, uh, we, studied English, we studied English as well. So lots of textbooks were taught in, in English. Uh, and my English level uh, was quite, quite good even before I, I moved to UK. So it wasn't a problem. Uh, we also had extra tuitions by the school uh, because the, the, the change of syllabus was different because the Hong Kong, we did a completely different um, exam system for the GCSE. So we, they had to give us tuition for certain subjects to get to their level. So uh, yeah, it, it went smoothly, fortunately. Okay. And then you decided to go on and study law? Yes. And was that interest always there? <laughs> Um, that, that's, that's another story, a romantic story, I think. Um, when I was like five years old and my dad used to work for the government as a, a, a it's called Independent Commission Against Corruption, the department he works for. 
So they're basically prosecutors. And he has always wanted to be a lawyer, but didn't make it. So um, at five years old, I was at home and he came home one day with a big bag and said, he said to me, hey, Olivia, could you stand in front of a mirror? And so I said, okay, he must have got something cool for me. So I was waiting for something like teddy or a nice dress and out come this robe. It's like those court dress he got. I don't know where he got it from. So he put it on me and said, do you like this look? And I thought, oh, it looks quite cool. So he said, okay, Ben, be a lawyer. So I thought, okay, so if I be a lawyer, I get to wear like that then. Okay, I'll do that. It's a fashion <laughs> decision. That's incredible. <laughs> I've never heard a story like that for, for why you went into law, but it's it's a lovely story. But um, he did, actually, he did try a lot. He, he, mm. he sent me to lots of uh, internships for summers. So, because a lot of his friends are uh, actually, they, 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 they're owners of law firms. So he sent me to do all these internships in different law firms so that I know exactly what, mm. apart from that court dress, <laughs> what actually entails. And so, yeah, and then I, I, I went to the, all these internships and I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. So yeah, that's what I did. I went ahead and did law. Okay. So in terms of kind of like what would you think have been um, the, the key highlights of being an, an international lawyer for you? Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite the key highlights as an international lawyer. I think, I think the good thing is that you get to understand different cultures better than the local lawyers. Because, uh, for example, lots of my clientele are from people from abroad as well as locals. Because it's for myself, I'm kind of a mixture of the two cultures <laughs> into one. So I get along with both sides. So I understand how they do things. Because it's actually quite important to understand people's way of thinking and their culture. It does help a lot in terms of running cases, in terms of getting business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think I do have that advantage. And also because of my language skills, it's also helped because I'm basically trained in the, in the UK and my English is generally considered quite good. So it's because of Hong Kong court, um, they use Chinese and English, but, ma but mainly English, I would say, because especially in the civil courts, uh, most of the documents has to be submitted in English uh, un unless there is a litigant in person. So unless the other side has no lawyers, basically, otherwise they'll all be written in English. So English is a, a very important factor to be a lawyer in Hong Kong. Okay, so if someone was thinking of, of making a move to, to say Asia and practicing mm. there and they didn't have the language skills, they only spoke English, that wouldn't be insurmountable then? Is that, is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah. They, I, yeah. I think, I think uh, let's put it this way. Uh, for example, my current trainee, she's Korean and she can't oh, Sorry, I, I missed that. She's Korean, Korean. Okay. She's from Korea. Okay, so she can't speak Cantonese, but she, she managed to run all the cases for me. So you can see... It is possible, and um, there is a, a a need for foreign lawyers uh, to join the Hong Kong legal industry because the clients is not only local clients. There are clients from different jurisdictions that needs help. So, so where would your clients say be from all around the world? Would they? Yes. Yes. Okay, and the type of work that you do is also fairly broad. Just when I did the introduction, all the kind of the different areas that you um, have been exposed to, and also that the firm covers. So, like, kind of thinking about that, um, when you are, say, recruiting a, a lawyer from overseas, say, a, even a junior lawyer, what type of things would you look for when you're doing recruitment? What What would be some of the the maybe the non-negotiables. 
language skills definitely language so skills is yeah so language helps. english yes is okay. extremely important uh be able to write properly no grammatic mistakes no typos um also uh we look for people who uh who are very careful and uh can and, and, and very detailed because every word is important in a legal document so uh, also we need we look for people who um who are team players because in fact in the legal industry you see big firms, you see small firms, but at the end of the day, even the huge firms, they divide into little teams to do like a project. So you have to be able to work with others, like other associates, the partners, uh, everyone works some parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the project to make it uh, complete. So it's important. And also people, actually what, what, we, are, what we need are people who can follow instructions as well and um, be responsible. Uh, it's, it's very important to be able to uh, respond to clients uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. promptly. In fact, I, I remember I worked in a UK firm before where they, uh, they follow something called ISO. It's a, it's a system, international system where they have got very strict criteria to follow. And in there, you need to respond to a client within 24 hours. And it's a, it's a very important thing. Uh, also to submit work on time. So you cannot miss deadlines. It's, it's not like homework. You can miss deadline and say, well, I'm so sorry. I'll just hand it in later. You can't because uh, the consequence can be draconian in, in legal proceedings. If you miss deadlines, your, your case can be struck out. So, uh, we need people who basically feel responsible and 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 proactive in in, in doing things. It's, it's very important that they from day one that they need to have this sense of responsibility. It's because otherwise it's very difficult to to train them if everything has to be reminded a thousand times <laughs> late. Yeah. Uh, that is is a no no. Yeah. So they need to be very um, sort of self-driven, self-motivated. What, yeah. what about um, like in terms of their experience working in, say, commercial law or another area of law? So, for example, I notice that your firm um, also works in family law. So how hard would it be for someone to, well, maybe let's start off with someone with a kind of more of a commercial law um, background and then if we can talk about someone that maybe didn't have commercial law but they'd worked in family law but they were looking for an overseas opportunity how hard would that be for someone to kind of hit the ground running coming to to Hong Kong for example okay it depends on whether they're qualified lawyers or not if they are not qualified lawyers and they just want to be a paralegal it will be easier because um it's, it's kind of realistic uh, in, the, in the business world. If you get paid higher, they expect more. So if you're a qualified lawyer, I can say it will be a lot harder because they have to pay you a qualified lawyer's salary. So they expect you to be able to deliver the qualified lawyer's uh, work quality in that field. So if you're not actually trained in that field, it's, it's kind of difficult for you to actually deliver the, the, mm -hmm. the work quality. So um, lots of people will join it as paralegals because paralegals, they basically assist uh, lawyers. So they will get to learn different things. And, and, and normally the partners are more lenient towards paralegals because they know they don't know a lot. Let's put it this way. So um, if, they're yeah. actually... Yeah, sorry, Olivia, go on. So, for example, uh, myself, I used to be a PI and clinical negligence lawyer in the UK. I actually retrained to become a commercial litigator in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. so, although they are both contentious work, they are still very different. Mm. The reason being, I know that in the Hong Kong industry, um, the way they function in terms of fees is very different from the UK. 
So condition, conditional fee nor contingency fee is allowed in Hong Kong. So you can imagine, because a lot of PI claims are basically run on like conditional fees or contingency fees yes. in US and UK. So without that, it's kind of difficult for this area of law to blossom. Because if everyone has to go and pay out of their own pockets, unless you are super poor, that you mm. can get in, onto legal aid or you're super rich, it's difficult. So um, I made a conscious decision to change to become a commercial litigator instead, because I know that that's a, a much wider area of law and easier to get work. So it's something you will need to retrain yourself to become. Uh, and, and I know that there are actually lots of uh, foreign lawyers actually uh, come to Hong Kong to work, to practice their own jurisdiction. For example, in my law firm, we have got a BVI lawyer. He practiced BVI law. So there are also quite a lot of Australian lawyers in Hong Kong, and they practice Australian law in Hong Kong. So it is, they're called registered foreign lawyers. So it is possible. Right. And if for those people who are already qualified as Australian lawyers, they can do something called OLQU. That's what I did. It's called Overseas Lawyers Qualification Exam. So they trans, transferred to become a Hong Kong lawyer by passing um, some, some examinations. Then they get, it's a bit like driving license. <laughs> so you get your driving license, you then do it's something. It's a bit harder. <laughs> yeah, you get another driving license. Because <laughs> Australia, yeah, because Australia and Hong Kong, we are both common law jurisdictions, so it's a lot easier to move. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's a possible thing, and and there are actually quite a lot of people already here. Yeah. Okay, that's really good to know. And so the overseas lawyer qualification is that something that is very very difficult to get, um, or not? Uh, the OLQE, um, I'm actually sitting on the board at the moment for the uh, exemption committee. Um, well, whether it's difficult or not, I think it, it really, it's a bit like when an exam is difficult. Uh, okay, let's put it this way. I pass on first time. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, well, um, because you're brilliant. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... It's, yeah. it's not something that people should be put off by. No, I think no. it's it's an open book exam. It's yeah. not like they ask you to memorize everything into your head. So, and I, it's the law is actually similar as well. So I think I think it, okay. I think it's it's not that difficult for common law jurisdiction lawyers. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Now that's great to know. And someone that had been um, doing a bit of family law. Um, maybe had been practicing as a family lawyer for a couple of years and decided they wanted to do something different. Would that be something that they could also pick up, or yeah. would that be that wouldn't be impossible either? It's very no. similar. Mm. Okay. Oh, that's really reassuring. So, when do you think is the best time for someone to consider making a move overseas? Either to, uh, anywhere, it doesn't have to be Hong Kong, it, it, it could be the UK. So from your perspective and from having that, that life experience behind you, what, what do you think is a good time? Personally, I think um, after you qualify in one jurisdiction first, I mean, I mean at least you're a qualified lawyer in one jurisdiction. Uh, I think it will also be a good idea to practice for a few years first at least that you can show that you, you, you can do it. Um, and then you can do the transfer test. I mean, I think UK has got, now got the same thing as well. Very similar thing. It's for overseas lawyers to transfer to become a UK lawyer, same thing. So you can then apply to do that and, and move to whatever country you want to move to, uh, just doing those exams. I think it's a, it's an interesting experience in life. I mean, you get to practice in different places and see different parts of the world. It, it's, it's very, it's, it's very, and also you will notice there are lots of difference in terms of how law firm runs as well. 
mm. they, they do run very differently. Uh, for example, in the UK compared to Hong Kong, I, I noticed a lot of difference uh, when I first came back. In fact, I thought it was a little bit difficult at the beginning. It's, it's, a, it's the pace of the city. Hong Kong is super fast. And I remember when I came back, first came back, I thought, why everyone's moving so fast? I mean, why are they were always run, walking so fast? Where are they all rushing to? <laughs> I remember I was on the street and like everywhere, zoom, 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 zoom. It's like, what's going on? Uh, yeah, it's just the way. So that's so yeah, it's like, like, They're always like, like in a rush or something. And, but you actually the care. city, it's, it's like that. But it's... um. It's a work hard, play hard city, okay? So we have got like uh, a place called Lan Kui Fong in Central where there are lots of pubs and bars and clubs and it just opens like 24 hours and people go party there. And that place is right next to all the offices. So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's very convenient. <laughs> but the, the working hours I have to admit is quite long in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's long okay so I, I don't want to lie to you it's long um generally well, people work until in law firms at, at least seven something and what time yeah. they start at about eight or uh, nine 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 yeah about yeah. nine o'clock um but sometimes weekends as well it really yeah. depends on the workflow yeah because in the legal industry frankly you can't really say okay Six o'clock, I have to go now, I'm sorry. I have to mm. switch off all my WhatsApp, uh, switch off my mobile, don't call me. Saturday, Sunday, family day, sorry, no. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, <laughs> because the clients will call you, no matter what. So yeah. when they call the partners, then the clients will call you. <laughs> so it's it's something um, law graduates will need to be aware of. It's, it's just life, yeah. Okay. So well-being and things like that, um, is that on the agenda as well? Like, is that a big kind of area that the firms um, and organisations are looking at for lawyers in terms of kind of trying to prevent burnout and fatigue amongst lawyers or, or maybe it's not as high on the agenda? I think even when I was in the UK, those international firms, frankly, they work, people, they work their socks off. Um, yeah. It's just the culture. Uh, mm. And how to say, if you, uh, let's put it this way. If you really love something, you won't find it hard work. But if you don't like that thing that much, it will be a task. Yeah, that's a great, um, actually, that's a great um, summary of that too. So you have to really love it. Yeah, I've heard that before. A lot of people say that about law. Yeah, you can't just do it half-heartedly. No. Yeah, interesting. Um, I did have another question and I think it just completely slipped, but it will probably come back to me. So it sounds like it. It what, what you're kind of saying is that you would either um, think of coming overseas and doing some work either as a paralegal so that could be like a nice entrance point or otherwise um, get some runs on the board in, in your home country, maybe do two to three years um, post admission experience, um, get yourself up to speed, build your qualifications and your experience and then look at moving overseas. So it's um, kind of the, the bit in the middle is probably a little bit tricky. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now that's great advice. So what about um, careers outside of commercial law, like you mentioned before about personal injury um, or, or even in kind of criminal law? What, what other roles are there out there um, perhaps that might have more of a, a balance or might be kind of a little bit um, easier for people to think about if they don't want to kind of go into these commercial roles? Um. If you don't want to join a private uh, practice, mm. um, then you can go in-house, in-house counsel. They do recruit in-house counsel. Um, and I do know a lot of uh, foreign lawyers actually practice as in-house counsel. Generally speaking, it's actually easier for corporate lawyers to move around uh, mm. in different countries than litigators because the court system can be quite different. 
So, but corporate work is kind of kind of similar. So, and okay. they don't need to go to court. So, uh, law firms are more open to recruit corporate lawyers from other jurisdictions um, because of, of, of the fact that they need to sign all these documents. Normally, you will need a, uh, a lawyer from that jurisdiction to sign all these documents if you go to court. But if it's like a, a deal or a, a, an agreement, drafting agreements, they don't actually need to go to court. So they are more open-minded to recruit foreign lawyers to do them. So yeah, it's it's something you can consider is in-house or do corporate work in private practice. Uh, or I mean, family law, it's possible because that's, that's quite similar to Hong Kong court. Um, PI law will be tricky, I think. Um, even I don't do that. <laughs> oh, I do it on the side, but not as my main business. Yeah. Uh, criminal law, I think it's not a good idea because um, lots of, they do require the Chinese element because most of the clients uh, speak Cantonese. Um, okay. So, <laughs> it's, so it's not like a business. I so when it comes to business, it's, yeah. uh, if, yeah. if the clients is, is a business, it's easy or a corporation. But yeah. if it's like individuals, it will be a, a lot more tricky that, unless you can find someone who can speak English. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend criminal law to come to Hong Kong to, to do that because it, you may struggle to find clients. Yeah. Okay. So... That's, that's been really good just to kind of get this, um, just to get that reality and uh, on the ground information. I think that's kind of very useful for people that are considering that. So what, what can, just a couple of last questions, what can individuals do now then to set themselves up for maybe a stint overseas? So what types of things could they be doing to make themselves even get a look in um, for overseas opportunities, any kind of suggestions? Um, I think um, do something that uh, has got connection with Hong Kong or Asia to show the employer that you have interest in, in that jurisdiction. Or if you want to go to UK, then maybe build up some connection with UK I don't know, uh, any uh, societies or things like that. So people know that you're not just going there <laughs> randomly. <laughs> yeah. And also try to build up your CV to look different from others. Because to be honest with you, I have got like, nowadays I recruit, um, for example, trainees. Most of them have got lots of A's and then they're all great A's in piano, ballet, um, <laughs> all these typical things which it's not really relevant to the work to be honest um so what i'm looking for really it's not about their musical talents um or their dancing talents but more to do with the language skills for example i recall there was a um a candidate who had five languages um so I was quite impressed. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll take her in. In fact, most of the trainees in my firm now, they can all speak like at least two or three languages and some four. So we're talking about to, to, to professional levels. So the more languages you can get, the better. That's, that's the key. And also do something that's different from others. Like for example, um, involve in like, I don't know, doing write, writing articles for magazines or things like that, be a, a, some sort of things that's involve writing skills to demonstrate that you're good at writing or um, good at business, or maybe even start your own business, no matter how small it is. I mean, to show people that you, you can run something yourself. It, it's something you have, you cannot, yeah, it's something you need to do that stands out, basically. Yeah, and, and these are things I think stands out more. Our leadership skills. Yeah, for example, like, I recall I we recruited someone because that person was a head girl of the of school. I mean, it's these are things that people would think, or house captains, the mm -hmm. things like that. It, it has to be different. So, yeah, yeah do something different. <laughs> 
because <laughs> all TVs are the same. <laughs> and, and the benchmarks is getting higher and higher, isn't it? I mean, um, it's it was really interesting what you said. I liked um, those suggestions, and I think the languages is, is 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 an important one as well for people that are obviously looking at going overseas. So I'm just going to ask you one last question. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> Even though you're still incredibly young, but yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, 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 my parents like me to be a lawyer, but I actually like to do other things. And uh, that's why now I also run a PR company, a PR event company. I just started six months ago and also a company secretarial business and an IT company. It's, I think it's a good basis to be a lawyer. Uh, and I'm glad I followed my parents' uh, way of, of doing things because at the end of the day, it's a solid background you have. And also... Because I started a law firm, I get to see lots of things that I wouldn't have seen um, if I just started off as like a marketing person and that's it. But now I get to achieve my own passion as well as uh, do something that's more substantial and more solid um, for the society. Um, I, I, To be honest... It, I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you've got the, the, the businesses as well that you do um, in your spare time. Not that I'd imagine you'd have much spare time, but you're, you're kind of saying really um, just to have other interests outside of law as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm. I, I, recall, uh, I recall someone told me when, when I was in the UK and that, a uh, person said to me, if I die tomorrow, I'll have no regrets because I've used all my time in a constructive way in terms of my career, in terms of my family, um, and I achieved everything. And I've done everything I could have done. Uh, I've went around the world, look at things. So, and I recall she said to me, Olivia, make sure you use your life constructively. And make sure if tomorrow you die, you have no regrets. And I think that's a very, very important quote I remember from that person. And since then, yes, I become this super energetic human. And I think it is, um, it's something that I want lots of people to hear because it's a very good teaching. Mm. Yeah, use your time like constructively. Achieve yes. as yes. much as you can. It's, it, life is a journey. So, yeah, you never know when it's going to stop. So it's best to see all the sights. <laughs> I love that. Well, that's like, like a, probably a perfect um, place to end with that like very philosophical um, quote and, and, and ideas. I love that. So I just would love to say thank you, um, Olivia. That has just been wonderful to hear all your insights and perspective. And I, I know that all the people that are listening will take away so much information and it's just been a joy to, um, to meet with you. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> so a big welcome to Michael O'Kane, who is our next speaker. And Michael joins us as part of our webinar on how to start your international career as a lawyer. And he will be drawing off his extensive and fascinating career and a little bit about Michael before I hand over to Michael. So Michael leads the, the firm and the business crime team as senior partner with Peters and Peters, one of UK's leading firms, law firms in business crime, commercial litigation and compliance and is based in London. Michael has acted for companies, senior executives and high net worth individuals in many of the most high profile and complex national and international business crime cases. He has particular expertise in international corruption, criminal cartels, financial sanctions, Interpol, 
extradition and private prosecutions. Before joining Peters and Peters, Michael was a senior specialist prosecutor at the Crown Prosecution Service, CPS, in their headquarters. There, he was a key member of a small specialist unit responsible for the prosecution of serious and high profile fraud, terrorist, state security, and special interest criminal matters, including the Stansted Airport Afghan airline hijacking and the prosecution of Paul Burrell, Princess Diana's butler. He has been recognised twice in the lawyer's top hot 100 and been described as being top of the referral lists of many city firms for independent advice for directors. Michael has also been recommended as a leading individual on international sanctions by Who's Who Legal Trade and Customs in 2021. So a big welcome to you, Michael. Thank you for joining you. us. If we start off, and you can give, um, give us a little bit of an overview of your career to date, and maybe you know, one or two of the highlights that have st stood out for you. Thank you, Susan. So it's getting on for nearly <clears throat> 30 years ago that I qualified into the law. Um, I went to university in Manchester, and then I came to London and did the bar. So I actually qualified as a barrister, and now I'm a solicitor. Um, and when I qualified as a barrister, I went into government practice, as you've said, I worked for the Crown Prosecution Service for eight years. Five years of that was working in South London, where um, pretty rough communities, and I was doing street crime. So rape, robbery, murder, those sorts of cases, lots of drugs cases, and uh, prosecuting those from the um, from the ground up, so to speak. So from the from the least serious courts all the way through, we had a system within the Crown Prosecution Service in those days, not the same now, where you followed your cases from um, the lowest courts to the highest courts. I then did three years, as you've said, in a specialist unit. There are only a few of us. And we did sort of national security, terrorism and um, special interest cases, mm. which, were, which were absolutely fascinating. Every single one of them were, were, was extremely interesting. And I'll come on to talk a little bit later about why that experience was pretty formative. In 20, 2002, I then left and I joined the firm I'm now the senior partner of, which is Peters & Peters. And as you said, Peters & Peters is a leading white collar civil fraud commercial litigation firm in London. We have about 46 lawyers here working on pure litigation and fraud related mostly. And the vast majority of the work that we do is international in flavor. So, um, we have we travel extensively. Um, we have to engage with uh, prosecuting agencies or um, employment or defendants in multiple jurisdictions all over the world. Often we manage litigation in multiple jurisdictions, and I can talk a little bit about that as well. So in terms of in terms of highlights, you've mentioned a couple of the cases when I was prosecuting. Obviously, they were very very difficult cases. The Stansted hijacking was a plane that was hijacked by a group of um, Afghans flown to London, was on the tarmac for three days. It came via Moscow. Um, and they had uh, um, uh, machine guns, grenades, um, and they were eventually all arrested. There's 14 of them were prosecuted at the Old Bailey for um, hijacking uh, an aircraft and various terrorist offences. Um, in my defence practice, I've done many, many cases involving negotiating with the US Department of Justice, I'm acting for a lead individual in a 1MDB fraud, which is a huge $7 billion fraud um, on uh, the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund with lots of tentacles in many jurisdictions, including Australia. Um, uh, and uh, currently we are um, acting for a number of relatively high profile uh, Russians, but also various businesses who have and found themselves with a great number of uh, sanctions related issues as a consequence of Western sanctions imposed on Russia following the unlawful invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February. So it's a it's a it's a broad church mm. in terms of a practice. Absolutely. That um, sounds like a fascinating career. So most of the people that would be working at um, your firm would have similar backgrounds to yourself or all very diverse and different. Well, we are, we're pretty diverse. So there's a number of former prosecutors um, who are here. There are a number of sort of what I've called a sort of died in the wall 
uh, criminal defense lawyers who started out in the magistrates courts and in the crown courts represented people. Um, we also have you know, an increasing number of people who are coming to us from the bigger firms, the magic circle firms, uh, both in London and and abroad. We have had we have recruited from Australia, which which is why this um, this uh, webinar is particularly interesting to me because that's been a fascinating experience. We work with a number of white collar uh, uh, firms and also the magic circle and silver circle firms in London, <clears throat> who are big international firms who also have special relationships in Australia. And a number of the partners that I have worked with in some of those firms have have been Australian by origin and came to the UK a few years ago and have established excellent reputations and excellent practices for themselves here in London. Okay, so to do your type of work, I mean, your your background as senior prosecutor seemed um, to be very kind of significant and very important in the work that you're doing now. So would you say that your background um, has been like ideal to kind of jump off that or to leverage off that or you think that um it doesn't necessarily uh, other people have got quite different backgrounds as well as you were saying so they might be from from firms as well i i think <clears throat> susan that the, the the fact that i was a prosecutor was probably quite important a few years ago yeah. it's been a long time since i prosecuted so i think it's becoming less of um of a of an issue. What I think is very important, particularly about the first five years of prosecuting, was that, you know, I was very young, I was in my early 20s, we were, we were essentially thrown into the deep end. If you demonstrated any sort of work ethic, and a moderate amount of ability, you got a huge amount of responsibility in those days. And I suspect it's probably still true to this day, in all countries, and particularly, you know, also in, our, in Australia, if you if you work for the government. So that was a great grounding in getting a lot of responsibility to progress cases, some of them very significant, at a very young age. So you learn how to deal with pressure, you learn how to make decisions relatively quickly, and ultimately, and I'll come back to this as well, you learn what is the critical aspect, I think, of being a successful lawyer, whether it's national or international, and that is judgment. You learn from your mistakes and hopefully over time you become a better and a be better and better lawyer of being able to exercise calm rational judgment on behalf of your clients dealing with quite complex issues okay we we might explore that a little bit later but before we do that i'm just interested um to know about the travel component in your work so being an international lawyer what does that actually involve and what does that look like for you so in terms of travel, <clears throat> as I've said, the cases take us to, to, to many different places. Sometimes the, it's very, very intense. So for example, on the 1MDB case I was telling you about a couple of years ago, before COVID, we were traveling backwards and forwards to the Middle East, probably every couple of weeks. And we did that for about 18 months. Um, a few years before then, we were doing three large cartel cases uh, and that meant frequent meetings with the US Department of Justice or meetings with clients who were detained in the United States. We also, um, for example, flew to Australia. We, were in, we went to Sydney for a week. We brought a client with us. We were interviewed by the ACCC in relation to a criminal cartel involving international airlines. Um, these days, for, my, my, for personal reasons, I have tried to cut out um, you know, much of the sort of long haul travel that's concerned. But you know, many members of my firm were doing a big case in Africa. They are repeatedly flying down to Southern Africa. I was in uh, Joburg just a couple of months ago for a meeting in relation to a client. And uh, we are you know, backwards and forwards to various EU member states. We do a lot of work before the European Union courts, a lot of work in France, sort of Germany, those sorts of places. So um, it's it's unusual in our small firm for me to walk around the floor plate and find that all the partners and the associates are here. There'll always be a few of them who are on some international trip representing clients. So it's important for you um, to be able to go and travel to those countries um, rather than obviously doing it through, through Zoom and, and meetings all the time. 
is that a, that's a critical part of getting the information gathering and is that is that right like I'd imagine no that would be quite sounds quite exhausting and particularly some of those countries that you travel to they're they're, they're not easy countries necessarily well I think that's true I mean I I think that the travel will reduce as a consequence of Zoom because clients won't necessarily think that it's necessary, they necessarily but they possibly won't want to pay for it because it's expensive. But at the same time, I think there is no substitute for sitting down with a client. If you're trying to get mm. their instructions on a sort of complex matter and try to work out exactly what's going on, you've got lots and lots of files and documents. For example, on the recent trip to South Africa, it was very important that we went because we were meeting with lawyers in South Africa. They've been Gosh. working on the case for many years. They had all the files. We went to their offices. We were able to really get into the detail, brainstorm about what the possible legal options were in relation to this particular client. Um, and that just simply couldn't have been done on Zoom. I mean, some of the stuff you can do on Zoom, and we're doing some of the Russian stuff um, on Zoom, obviously, because there are real travel limitations now as a consequence of sanctions. But I don't think there's any substitute for sitting face to face with people and really trying to understand what's going on. I mean, the, because you like kind of you, you're working across so many different jurisdictions, how do you get up to speed with that from a from a legislative perspective? How do you navigate that? Is that is that difficult or I'm assuming it yeah, might a, not be? Well, that's a really good question. And I think it, it, it's, it's relevant for those who, who, who are listening and thinking about having an international career. I, I wouldn't get bogged down worrying about, oh, if I'm going to go to the Middle East, I need to understand what the law is in the Middle East. Um, what we tend to do is we will instruct law firms who we know and trust are very good law firms in each of the jurisdictions where the clients have issues. So it's their primary responsibility to brief us on what the law is and how it might affect the particular client situation. What we are trying to do in many cases is look at the sort of global strategy for sorting out a client's problems if they are in multiple jurisdictions. And what I would say about that, which is what is much more important is rather than being bogged down in what is the law in Switzerland, what's the law in France, what's the law in the United States, it's actually being cognitive of what is going on in the world. Mm. So I think, I mean, what, and I say this to, 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 to others who work here in this firm, very, very, very important to keep up to date with what's going on in the world in terms of current affairs. And the easiest way to do that, and it's what I do every single morning, is I read the Financial Times just over a cup of coffee, 15 minutes. It's, it never happens that I will read the Financial Times and find something in, and not find something in there that is of relevance. So if you look at today's, for example, obviously they've got the Australian election result on the, on the front page. On page two of the FT uh, is a whole story about Russians and the impact of um, uh, Russian sanctions on litigation in London. So, you know, it's ab absolutely fascinating. And it's something so, that clients, yeah. clients are very sophisticated and they, 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 they want their lawyers to to demonstrate an understanding of current affairs wherever it is happening, because everything is interconnected in this world, despite the fact that people say globalization is dead. I, I, I don't agree that that's the case in relation to law, because if you just look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that has had implications in relation to Western powers coordinating on sanctions. It's going to have huge implications for the military industri industrial complex for the next 20 years and on that, our security. For Australia, it will have implications in relation to Australia's security arrangements. And I know your prime minister is now going off to meet the Quad in Tokyo today. It'll have implications for China and Taiwan. It'll have implications on global food supply. All of these things have got huge legal ramifications and international businesses and high net worth individuals need to understand where they fit and how their lawyers are going to be able to help them to navigate these changing times. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I've got so many questions. I don't know where to start. <laughs> I just want to keep on firing them at you. But I, before I kind of talk a little bit about what you look for when you actually recruit, and I'd be interested to know some of the Australian lawyers in terms of their background, um, just give us a bit of an overview of what is it about your your career that is is just driven you. I mean, it sounds so fascinating. 
but it also sounds quite tiring as well. So maybe just kind of give us a bit of a, a summary of like what are the things that um, give you the greatest satisfaction and then perhaps what are some of the challenges um, of having an international career? So I think if I go back, as it, this is a sort of slight sort of um, um, therapy session for me, if I go back in time, I grew up in Northern Ireland in the 1970s and the 1980s. So um, you cannot grow up in Northern Ireland during those times without being embroiled um, in, in politics, political discussion, political thinking. I did a degree in law and politics. And so um, I have been drawn to mm. work, which has a very significant political flavor. Now, what that means in terms of our practice is as the world ship moves away from democracies, which it had done up until probably the 24th of February, I think that shift might now be changing. What you will see, and we are a little bit of a um, um, barometer for that in our firm, is that a lot of our work is moving east. So it's moving to Russia, to the Middle East, to India, to China, um, Malaysia, Indonesia. And one of the reasons for that is um, the, the countries where kleptocracy is, is on the rise or where you've got very, very powerful leaders, they tend to um, have a habit of abusing the criminal justice system to target their political and commercial enemies. We see this all the time. So, 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 so whether it's in Russia, as I said, or whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in Africa, wherever it might be. So it's the same playbook you don't need to know the technical law. It's the same playbook. And you can then use the courts in London or you can use international arbitration or you can use the United Nations or whatever it might be to try to defend the interests of your clients. You can use Interpol to prevent them being becoming fugitives. You can use the courts to fight extradition you know, in, case, in those sorts of cases. So it, it, in that sense, it's, it's, it's hugely interesting. As I say, it's challenging because... For somebody who may just have a narrow practice area and thinking, gosh, I don't know if I can get into this, it might seem quite intimidating. But essentially, the decision making, whether it's in Azerbaijan or whether it's in London or whether it's in Melbourne or Sydney, the decision making is, is really the same mental process that takes place. The risks that arise are the same sorts of risks wherever, you, wherever it is that you're practicing, wherever it is that you're doing business. So once you sort of understand that, they understand the way the human mind works in these sort of situations and how to sort of try to navigate, um, you, can do, you can do this sort of work anywhere. Okay, okay, now thank you for that. That's really, um, really good to know. Um, so for people that are thinking of packing up their bags and coming over to say the UK, Hmm. Tell us a little bit about um, the lawyers that you recruit and which ones stand out. And I'd also be interested just to get your, your perspective on when is a good time perhaps for someone to consider coming overseas. I mean, obviously now with the pandemic, people can start um, doing that. But how much experience do they need? I, I think it's probably a good idea to get a couple of years of practice under your belt in Australia first. I, mm. I so, you um, know, obviously there, there will be practice areas which don't have so much of an, of an international dimension to them. Um, mm. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking things like maybe like sort of family law, that kind of thing. But in relation to the sort of work that we do, just litigation generally, or competition law, corporate law, arbitration, First of all, what I would say the good news is there is a that there is a real shortage in the London job market. And obviously, London is one of the prime legal centers in the world, if not the prime legal center in the world. Many, many international arbitration agreements are written with London as the arbitration center. Many contractual agreements are written subject to the law of England and Wales. So a lot of cases get litigated here or get settled here in 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 London. Um, so in the practice areas of sort of litigation, arbitration, um, law firms are crying out for, um, for young lawyers, young, talented lawyers. I, I, as I say, I've come across a lot of Australian lawyers 
um, in the course of our practice, lawyers who come to our firm, lawyers who come to other firms. And I don't want to necessarily um, 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 generalize too much, but what I have found is um, extremely open, um, extremely good communicators, uh, extremely hardworking, proactive, rather than just sort of sitting back, um, uh, they, they tend not to be very shy, if I can put it that way. <laughs> they tend to speak their mind, they tend to speak their mind. These are, I think these are all great positive qualities. This is what, yeah. what we're looking for. I think, I think post pandemic, amongst the younger generation, there is a, there's, a, there's an anxiety about coming into the office. There's an anxiety about being too front, being too much on the front foot. Um, I, 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 we, we definitely look for those sorts of lawyers. We, we want people who are going to be proactive in all aspects of their legal work. And importantly, what I would be saying to somebody thinking about it is, you know, research the London market, choose a few firms that you're particularly interested in, and really research those firms and understand what they do. But more than that, what one of the things that really makes candidates stand out for me is that um, when we're interviewing, if you've not just thought about the firm and what the firm is doing, but think about what you can do, what you can do, what you can bring to the firm. Yes. I think a lot of reliance at the moment on when, when we interview people, sometimes they think, well, what's the firm going to do for me? I would yes. definitely turn that around a bit like, you know, JFK's inauguration speech, ask not what the firm can do for you, ask what you can do for the firm. Yeah. So really like important. That. Think, think about, think about, think about business development. Think about, well, where, where does the work come from for a firm like Peters and Peters or even some of these bigger firms? Where, where do they get their work? How can I help with that? Can I, can I, do I have contacts? Cause I'm Australian. Do I have contacts in law firms in Australia? Can I, can I write an article about the overlap between what happens in Australia and what happens in the UK? Can I help this firm to expand into its east, into the eastern market where there is a lot of activity? Um, th those are the sorts of things that I'd be, I'd be thinking about. But I, primarily, it's about, I think it was Warren Buffett who said when he was asked a question about, you know, what should I yeah. do? He said, the most important thing is to invest in yourself everybody is a brand everybody is a brand so how do you build your own brand and how do you invest in yourself and don't rely on other people so much you do stuff do stuff yourself off your own back i think yes. i think that's no. those are the sorts of qualities that we're looking for and lots of law firms get very obsessed by academic qualifications mm. we don't do that here what we look for are people for is is people with good judgment um, yeah. People who are people who are what I would describe as smart at life. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Smart at life. In other words, they exercise the same judgment when they are queuing up for a coffee um, as they do when they're talking to a client. So mm -hmm. they don't get stressed out. They are calm, rational, reasonable. They use charm to get the things that they want in life. Um, and essentially that's that they exercise good judgment in every situation that they are in yeah absolutely and i liked um what you were talking about before as well like i mean your interest in politics um so it's it's also being interested in the in the world around us as well so kind of looking um perhaps thinking broader and bigger and not necessarily only through the eyes of a lawyer but kind of beyond that so um i like that that's smart at life that's really a good tagline um what languages are languages something that you think would be useful or they're just like a, a, a nice thing to have but they're certainly not a critical thing i i don't find that they're absolutely critical um i know this sound this might sound rather sort of uh, uh backward looking but but you know, English is a, is you know the most spoken language mm. in, in, in the world, and in the legal community, obviously, it's a, it's it's the critical language. I mean, it, it's obviously helpful to be able to speak other languages: Arabic, Russian, 
Mandarin, whatever it might be. But that's pretty unusual, pretty unusual. But we do have people here who speak many, many different languages in our firm. And obviously, in some situations, it's hugely helpful. But I, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a massive plus for, for what, what we do, because English is you know, obviously so critical across multiple mm. jurisdictions. Okay, but some of the other other skills um, you mentioned as well. So also experience um, in maybe one of those areas of law that you mentioned before would be would be a positive thing as well. So maybe someone that's got a few, a few years post admission experience behind them, or would you prefer people that are maybe like later on in their career? I, I don't think it really matters too much. Yeah. In terms of the experience, I, I wouldn't want anyone watching this to think, oh, well, in order to go to a firm like the firm Michael's describing, I've got to do a couple of years of criminal law in Australia. I don't actually think that's necessary because, as yeah. I say, what we're looking for are people who've got, who've got good judgment. We recruited oh. somebody a few years ago from Australia who had not done any criminal law. And she turned out to be very successful and she went on um, to have and, and continues to have a very good career. So um, so it's really, as I say, it's more about are you going to be hardworking? Are you going to be sort of open, active, proactive, able to get into the sort of nuts and bolts of cases and get on well with clients in difficult circumstances? Th those are those are really the skills that we're. we're yeah. We're, we're... And how much can you do from at home so you'll say if you're in Australia and you're wanting to come I mean in terms of developing those relationships and speaking to recruiters would you would you recommend that you start doing that now from your home country as opposed to jumping on a plane <laughs> taking a bit of a risk and just playing it by ear a bit living dangerously well I would definitely advise researching the market mm. uh, uh, yes, speaking to recruiters or speaking to friends who've done it or whatever it might be. I, I would also start thinking about what sort of area of law I might be interested in doing and then starting to build, I say, build your own brand a little bit. So um, you know, maybe writing articles, writing blogs, sh sh just showing um, the wider world that you've actually got a real interest and a real appetite in a particular area um, rather than just, you know, your... Um, being op rather than being opportunistic <clears throat> you've yes. got to show that you've, you you're, you're investing in it and you have hmm. invested in it for a certain amount of time so obviously that's quite difficult to do if you're a student not impossible but it's more difficult but once you, if you get a position in, a, in an Australian law firm and you're working in a particular area it will be very very good later on if you decide to come to London to be able to show well this is obviously I did my job in this firm but I also did this in terms of writing or speaking or whatever it might be to to further my own interest in a particular area and further my own my own brand yeah okay now thanks that's great um just a, a couple of last uh, last questions what what do you think are some of the challenges of an overseas career i know you've kind of touched on them but for those yeah. that are a bit um undecided yeah well obviously the big challenge is Australia is a very long, long way away, mm. and um, family and friends um, can seem um, very cut off. That's easier now with 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 Zoom, um, so that's slightly less of a problem. But I think it still is a big issue for quite a lot of um, Australians who come to London. They their heartstrings are pulling them back over time. Secondly, I think, and this touches on something I was saying a little bit earlier. I do still think that some firms feel that um, Australia is very much at the sort of periphery of world events in terms of what's going on. And therefore they don't, they're not really in the hub and won't really have had a grounding in kind of you know, international developments. So that's why I think it's pretty important to be able to show that you do have that understanding. You are keeping up to date with what's happening in the world. And it's not just hunkering down in Australia and just thinking about Australian issues, particularly because you know, Australia was very closed over COVID and, and, and that might have exacerbated that, that, that state of mind. But I definitely think that this is Australia's time. I think that over the next 20 or 30 years, it's quite clear that 
um, you know, the, the, the way in which the world is moving. The Pacific is going to become um, you know, the, the major part of world interest, whether it's in economics, with the rise of China, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, with security concerns. We've seen all these agreements being put in place more, more recently that um, also with mining, you know, obviously in, in, in Western Australia, it's becoming a huge issue with the shortages that we have of particular precious metals going to mobile phones and going to conductors for cars, etc. So I think I think um, Australia is going to become very important jurisdiction. So to be able to have a foot in Australia and a foot in somewhere like London for being able to demonstrate to clients you understand the issues in both jurisdictions, I think it could be hugely beneficial to people's careers. Thank you. That's really good. That's great advice. Um, just a, a last question for you. Um, any anything that you would tell your younger self? Anything um, in terms of kind of advice, or I wish I did this, or I wish I did that? Any any kind of advice to a, a younger version of yourself? Of course, that's a very um, that's a very difficult question to answer. I think um, uh, don't give up. <clears throat> don't get disillusioned. We all have difficult times. We all get knocked off course, whether it's in our professional or personal lives. But I, 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 I definitely think you've got to just, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, you do have to accept when bad things happen. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a bit of time to, for the bruising to heal, uh, but you do have to dust yourself off, get back up, and you really do have to be confident in your own judgment and your own ability um, to be able to succeed. And as I say, if you do exercise good judgment, if you're a good person, it, it really does shine through. If you're collegiate and hardworking um, and you are conscientious, then um, I think that you'll have no difficulty in, in being successful in whatever, whatever it is that one turns one's mind to. And if I, um, I, I sort of wish I had told myself that when I was 21, <laughs> it might have helped and deal with a lot of unnecessary um, um, soul searching. Yeah, yeah. I think one of our um, other panelists said also that your heart has to be in it as well in, in law, like it's not um, a profession that you can do just half-heartedly. I think that you've definitely got to um, be, be driven by it and, and the, the good that you're doing as well. So I think that seems like that's a big, a big theme I don't know that I'm kind of getting from listening to your story in terms of, you know, making a huge difference and um, in, in terms of, yeah, the world and, and all, that, all that goes on and the fact that it's an unfair world as well, very, well, yeah. I mean, I, just outside, standing outside law generally, this is, a, this is a comment that's applicable to everybody. There was a survey done yeah. recently, I think it was, there was some horrible statistic that sort of 60 plus percent of people do not feel invested in the work that they do mm. uh, they're just going through the motions so um i definitely definitely think if you have the ability to do something that you're interested in that's what you should try to do um because that is definitely going to drive you to to, to limits and exceeding the limits by comparison with other people and it's going to fundamentally make you feel a great a greater sense of fulfillment and if it doesn't come straight away, it's just just be patient and it, it will come as well. Sure. So, yeah, there's definitely that. It, you might not necessarily start off exactly where you want to be, um, but it, it can come if you're really determined. Yeah. All right. Look, I'd like to um, thank you, Michael, so much for being a panellist and for sharing your insights and sharing your, your perspective. I think that um, those listening will take away many words of wisdom and lots of um, encouragement to, to give it a go. So thank you very much. My great pleasure, Susan. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.